All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to EU Ambassador Lecture in cooperation with the delegations of the European Union to Indonesia. My name is Ray, and I will be the moderator for today's event. I hope all of you are doing well and healthy during these difficult times. Please keep in implementing the health protocol, keep yourself and others safe from COVID-19 as the cases are rising up in the past few days. So Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia has the pleasure to once again conduct the EU Ambassador Lecture series with His Excellency Vincent Piquet, the Ambassador of the European Union to Indonesia. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you, Ray. It's good to see so, you again. Good to see you, sir. Today, we are also joined by several uh, FPCA chapter students from across Indonesia. And also, we would like to say thank you to our participants who are tuning in in our YouTube channel. Ladies and gentlemen, so um, earlier this month, the EU High Representative uh, for Foreign Affairs, uh, Joseph Borrell, visited Jakarta, and he presented the EU's strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. He set out the EU's strong engagement, working with partners to help keep the regional order open and rules-based. Our founder, Dr. Dino Padijala, also had the opportunity to have a dinner with uh, His Excellency Joseph Borrell and discussed the current issues of national and regional importance. And today we will have updates from His Excellency Vincent Piquet on the EU's new strategy for cooperation with the, with the Indo-Pacific region. What does it mean for the EU-Indonesia relations? Before we start, uh, I would like to remind everyone uh, to share your moments with us from today's lecture by tagging at FPC Indo and at underscore, sorry, and at uni underscore Europa on your social media post. Once again, uh, you can share your moments and also tag us at FPC Indo and also at uni underscore Europa on your social media post. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let us now begin the today's discussions. Ambassador Vincent Piquet, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Ray, for the, uh, for the welcome. and. And thanks to Park Dino and all colleagues from FPCI for the very steadfast and, and good cooperation that we've had uh, uh, for quite a while now. And I'm very keen that this will continue from our side. So great to see you again. And I greet, uh, of course, all participants from around in Indonesia, from potentially all chapters of FPCI. In this, uh, in this vast uh, country, uh, whether you link in via the Zoom or uh, via the, uh, the YouTube, um, uh, it's a great honor for me to have you uh, participating this, uh, this afternoon. Um, yeah, I've been in Indonesia now for coming on to almost uh, two years. Um, so um, I feel pretty much at ease being here despite, of course, the, the COVID uh, circumstances, uh, which are afflicting us all. And, uh, but on the whole, it's been a fantastic experience uh, for me as a diplomat representing the EU uh, to be posted in your, in your country. Um, the work of the, uh, my mission, the EU delegation to Indonesia and also to Brunei Dar es Salaam, um, focuses, of course, uh, uh, on the classical things of promoting the bilateral relations between the EU and uh, our host countries um, and in all areas uh, uh, of mutual interest. Uh, but outreach, uh, public diplomacy, of course, is a, is a core uh, feature of our work. And, and over the past uh, a year and a bit, of course, much of it has happened via the, uh, the digital media, which is a pity, of course, in some respect, because I, I'd love uh, to see and, and visit you uh, wherever you are and have um, discussions around a table. Uh, but uh, the advantage is that we can talk over longer distances. Uh, from uh, this morning, I uh, attended um, and spoke at a... Uh, at a webinar uh, with uh, municipalities uh, from all across Indonesia, 
uh, from uh, all the way from uh, from North Sumatra to the Moluccas and um, and to uh, uh, East Nusa Tenggara. Uh, so and all that uh, spanning these kilometers and kilometers of of uh, territory uh, as if it is is nothing. Um, so great to have you here. Um, I'll be speaking about the uh, uh, the EU's Indo-Pacific cooperation strategy. Um, before doing that, maybe just to recall that uh, uh, today and uh, tomorrow, uh, the um, the leaders of the uh, uh, twenty seven EU member states uh, will have their um, regular summit uh, um, uh, in taking place in Brussels uh, in physical format. Um, usually the leaders uh, come together twice every semester, twice every presidency. And back in Europe, we have the rotating presidency, of course. And, and uh, <coughs> at the present moment, it's, it's Portugal. So this is kind of the concluding summit under the uh, Portuguese presidency, and it is chaired as usual by uh, the the president of the European Council, uh, 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 Charles uh, Michel, um, who um, who has this permanent function has had it for a year and a half now. Um, on the agenda, uh, predictably, of course, COVID uh, will be discussed. Um, uh, the progress on uh, the vaccines uh, supply uh, in the EU. Uh, you may remember that back uh, at the beginning of this year, it started with quite some difficulties, startup problems, supply problems. Uh, but fortunately, we have um, overcome those. And uh, we can now say that we are confident that we will be um, achieving the 70% uh, vaccination rate uh, of our adult population by the end of next month. So that is a major result. You're talking then, um, uh, of course, about a population that is about, uh, the total population is 450 million in the EU and 70% of the adult population is a good 220 million people. So these are mass massive numbers um, that uh, are being looked after right now. Um, like uh, in Indonesia, we worried about uh, the new variants, uh, particularly the Delta um, variant. That's something to watch very, very closely. And um, uh, only yesterday, the, uh, the chief of the EU's um, uh, Center for Disease Control uh, spoke out very firmly, uh, calling on all governments and calling on all citizens uh, to do what they have to do uh, in terms of the social medical protocols, the mask, the hand washing, the social distancing, but also uh, pushing for people to join the vaccination campaign. Um, another, I think, interesting feature is... Uh, uh, in Europe is the introduction of uh, what we call the digital uh, certificate. Um, uh, bear in mind, uh, this is not a passport. Uh, this is a certificate that um, uh, registers uh, the holder's um, um, data about whether or not she he is um, has been vaccinated, so has been tested um, negative or has had uh, uh, the disease. And uh, the aim is of this certificate is not something that um, is important for persons from outside the EU, but it is meant to make the travel within the EU um, easier and simpler. Um, and uh, so that the tourist uh, season, which is coming up in Europe, uh, the European summer, so that the tourist season uh, can start off in a <coughs> responsible uh, manner. Um, related topic, of course, on the agenda is the economic recovery, um, and in particular, the, the work that is being done on the uh, uh, 
the rollout of the economic recovery plans uh, adopted by all member states <coughs> and um, approved by the European Commission with very sizable funding, uh, EU funding, of course, on the one hand, but also funding from the member states themselves um, to um, try and make sure that <coughs> this year, um, assuming that the pandemic stays uh, um, uh, under control, uh, uh, this year we can, um, our economy can rebound. Um, the forecast is for this year about 4.2% 4, 4 uh, growth. Uh, which is not yet um, going to bring us to pre-pandemic levels, but it will get us close uh, to that. Economic recovery and uh, linked to that, of course, the beginning of the, the green uh, transition that the EU uh, uh, is embarking on um, for the next uh, three decades. Uh, last point uh, on the agenda is uh, foreign policy. Um, with um, specific uh, countries being discussed. Uh, first of all, Turkey, a country uh, with which um, the EU has a, um, a an uh, accession, a membership process ongoing. Um, however, it's objective to say that it hasn't gone that much, uh, that, that far uh, over the past uh, uh, five years. Um, for political reasons, and because of uh, what we think is a uh, um, uh, a lack of um, performance by Turkey on some of the key criteria for um, for joining the EU, um, particularly in the democratic uh, democracy area. Um, but of course, even now, Turkey is a major major partner for us trade wise. Uh, plus, it is. Um, a, uh, for security um, uh, considerations, of course, a key uh, country uh, to have extremely close relations with, uh, given uh, the ge geostrategic position it occupies in um, on the southeastern side of the European Union. Um, the second country being discussed is Russia. Um, with which, um, unfortunately, our relations are at a very low point uh, presently. Very undesirable, of course, but explainable for objective reasons um, of um, problems that um, um, uh, we see uh, in Russia's foreign policy, Ukraine, Crimea, um, or its domestic policy, particularly on human rights, and most notable the case the, of uh, Mesut Navalny. And, um, but um, unfortunately, because at the end of the day, Russia is our neighbor, a very large neighbor. Uh, we have a very long historic ties with the country. And there's something totally unnatural about not having good relations with such a country. Um, so there is uh, certainly uh, going to be a reflection about what we can do with, with Russia, despite the issues we have and, um, and without compromising the, our values and um, to see what we, how we could possibly move forward. So that is uh, what's hap going to happen uh, today and uh, tomorrow in, in Brussels. Um, now, Indo-Pacific is not on the agenda this time, it was last time in, in March, and will be again, no doubt, in, um, um, after the European uh, summer break in the next uh, summit meeting of, um, of October. Um, Indo-Pacific, bear in mind um, where the EU is coming from. If you look back over the past 30 to 40 years, um, then um, at, in those days, of course, our relations with Asia were predominantly focused on, um, on the, the classical partnerships uh, we had, um, that is to say, Japan and uh, the Republic of Korea and in the Pacific, um, 
of course, Australia, New, New Zealand. Um, that was logical then, that was relevant then. Um, ever since, of course, we have seen the, the tremendous rise of China uh, since the 1980s, uh, which prompted, uh, of course, a rising political interest with China as well. And um, in a somewhat similar manner, also the same as India, um, not a, to the same degree, I must say, um, but uh, nonetheless, India in the South Asia, is, of course, uh, has been a, a, a long-standing partner for the EU. Um, ASEAN uh, came in rather early. Uh, we've had a, um, a, um, a cooperation agreement with ASEAN for uh, close to 40 years now, which is a good long time. Um, it's fairly loosely formulated. Um, the EU was younger then and uh, less, less developed. And ASEAN was also younger then and, uh, and less integrated than, than, than now. Um, but still it was there and it was very much a, a sign, um, a message from the European Union that we feel close to ASEAN, um, close to its fundamental objectives of promoting peace and stability. Uh, in the region uh, through closer cooperation amongst its members, uh, through integration in areas uh, where this was desired uh, by the members of ASEAN and where this was possible within um, ASEAN's constitutional uh, makeup, uh, if you like. Um, so a very early statement uh, by the EU of, uh, of interest and attachment uh, to ASEAN. And of course, we have moved on a lot ever, ever since those days. And it is now, of course, an, a very clear fact uh, that um, what was um, a, um, a, a relationship based on, 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 on regular partnerships. Um, we have now moved to a situation where uh, the EU has a relationship with the region uh, or with components within the region <coughs> that has, uh, has become uh, the, uh, the global center of gravity. Um, um, well, it's in political terms or in economically uh, or in economic terms and certainly that counts very very heavily um, the indo-pacific um, represents about 60 60 percent uh, of, uh, of global uh, GDP um, uh, so and um, it is a very fast growing region it's uh, it's share in in the global GDP growth is, is, is about uh, uh, the same uh, two thirds. And it's, um, it's the major, major trading uh, region and the largest des destination of EU products. And, um, and it is the largest source of all, all products uh, if you uh, uh, put it all together. Um, our main, well, uh, Four of our main trading partners uh, are in Asia and in the Pacific. Um, so all of that means that um, we have to pay very close attention to that and more so now than in the past. Bear also in mind uh, global trade. Um, you know, in the Malacca Strait, um, it's very close to, uh, to where I sit in, in Jakarta. 40% um, of our foreign trade passed, pa passes through that strait, uh, which of course is great on the one hand, but also a vulnerability on the other hand um, that we need to uh, bear in mind in, in our policy formulation. And um, we've got a very strong development agenda with uh, um, the Indo-Pacific, including with uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so we have um, a uh, 
desire uh, to make this region grow further, develop further in a sustainable manner, and bringing it to the region to a higher income status um, uh, as, as soon as possible. Uh, within um, um, the parameters of uh, of sustainable growth and uh, and development. Um, <clears throat> so, just a, a couple of facts and figures that I show to to explain why why we have come as EU to the realization that uh, we must do more with the um, Indo Pacific region and with the major. Uh, countries and bloc in the case of ASEAN that uh, that uh, constitute um, it. Um, another reason of course has to do with the geopolitical context and uh, you know how to summarize it I think the simplest way to say it is that uh, an, a global context that uh, is more uh, insecure uh, than it used to be there are more tensions than there used to be and there is worries about instabilities in the order and balance uh, uh, of the world, but also of the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region. Um, now, stability and um, development in the region, of course, depends on stable rules, stable uh, international uh, order and, and shared principles. Now, sometimes these are missing or not sufficiently present, to put it more diplomatically. Um, and the EU, as a rule-based uh, order, uh, uh, as a rule-based oriented um, political and economic bloc, of course, will seek to strengthen uh, the multilateral uh, rule-based order wherever it can and with whomever um, we can partner uh, to, to do precisely that. Uh, what does that mean in practice? In practice means, of course, um, building partnerships with the individual countries in uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, it means working at the regional level um, with ASEAN in particular, but also with other groupings where they exist. And it, um, it means working at the multilateral level whether it's the UN or the WTO, in order to together um, boost the, uh, uh, the rule-based order for cooperation, for security, uh, for trade, um, et cetera. Now, why do we think we are the right guy or girl to do that? That's a very relevant question. And um, I, I think, the EU um, has, of course, uh, a number of important assets to offer uh, to uh, the region. Uh, first of all, uh, we are um, a region, an entity uh, that is not aiming to dominate, dominate the world, that is not aiming to dominate certain regions, um, that is um, uh, aspires to uh, promote peace, stability um, as a principal value of uh, why we exist. Uh, we, we come out of the, the Second World War, remember that? And um, that peace and stability drive uh, is part of our deepest possible uh, DNA um, on the EU side. And that makes us... Um, more reliable, more trustworthy in some respects than some of the other um, partners. At least uh, we have the sense that um, countries in the in the region uh, recognize that. Um, one reflection of that recognition is the fact that um, last year, last December, the EU and ASEAN uh, decided to upgrade their relations. Um, we ha have set up, set up a strategic partnership between the two of us. Um, it's been, it was a long time coming, uh, but um, uh, we have uh, now got that result. And, uh, and I think it 
must mean that there is a reflection in ASEAN that the EU is a, uh, a entity it can work with um, in a, a world that is uh, where power politics uh, uh, are at play and not always in a uh, in a positive uh, in a positive manner um, let's not forget that asean like the eu uh, is founded on the, on the commitment to uh, rule based uh, multilateralism um, as a regional entity you can't be anything but rule based and uh, and multilateral uh, so uh, the ASEAN countries are united uh, also in, 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 a, in a wish not to be uh, squeezed or um, hindered uh, by uh, the rivalry between, uh, in particular, China and uh, the United States. Um, so ASEAN countries are therefore seeking for partnerships uh, that help them strengthen their their autonomy, uh, their uh, resilience, and their economic uh, potential uh, in uh, in the world, based on partnerships with, um, for instance, the European Union. So, whereby I'm saying that for us in our cooperation strategy, ASEAN has a very important role to play. Um, in ASEAN, often you hear the term ASEAN centrality in the foreign policy outlook uh, of ASEAN as a whole, and also of the individual members. Now we see it in a way from the European side in exactly the same way, ASEAN centrality for our uh, approach uh, with um, uh, towards the Indo-Pacific. Uh, where do we stand right now regarding um, this Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, our foreign ministers uh, adopted the, the broad guidelines for it in, in April, last April, uh, uh, two months ago. Um, the drafting of the detailed strategy is happening now and uh, it will be uh, published in uh, September. And um, the message of that strategy is a very straightforward and in a way simple one and that is the EU's wish to step up our engagement um, with the inner pacific and to work with all countries um, um, in the region to to boost trade and investment uh, to boost economic openness and to boost a sustainable approach to connectivity in the region and to boost a sustainable rule-based uh, political and security order. The um, EU um, uh, is able to put a lot on the table for doing precisely that. Uh, we have, our, of course, our um, economic uh, strength, uh, 27 countries, 450 million uh, inhabitants, um, the um, second or third largest economic bloc in the world, world um, almost at, at a par with the United States and, and China. So we have a lot uh, of critical mass available uh, for um, strengthening our relations with, uh, with ASEAN. And, and uh, in, the, in, in the coming uh, period, whether it's bilaterally or in due course also at a region to region uh, level. Um, but we look beyond trade, uh, we will certainly look uh, towards uh, the uh, security cooperation in a much more um, um, a prominent way than we uh, have done before. There's two reasons for that. Um, first of all, um, just looking at the EU itself, so we have made a lot of progress in the EU in defining uh, our defense and military uh, identity. Our, we have made a lot of progress in developing 
uh, a defense um, capacity, um, not by building up an army of our own, no, uh, we won't have an EU army, uh, but by <clears throat> bringing together resources of our member states in a way that strengthens uh, the mutual, enhances the mutual strengths, and in a way that um, allows um, uh, effects of uh, scale, upscaling to happen. For instance, if you talk about uh, the procurement of assets, uh, uh, or if you talk about uh, um, carrying out military um, or defense related uh, research. Um, so that development of the EU's defense profile has been, of course, a uh, very slow and gradual, um, but now we have something to offer and we are, for that reason, of course, reaching out to um, the region or the countries uh, that um, wish to partner with us. Um, secondly, um, the reason for engaging more in the security field has to do with the, the uncertainties and the instabilities that uh, I referred to earlier on. Um, our de dependence as EU on trade through the market straits is one example. Um, similar dependencies on, <coughs> on stable and secure um, seas uh, uh, to the south of, uh, of the um, of the uh, uh, the Gulf uh, countries and west of uh, sorry east of, uh, of the Horn of uh, Africa, uh, those are very critical interests uh, for us um, that we wish to protect, and that or for which of course we will wish to seek partnerships with like-minded countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific um, space. So you can expect, therefore, that um, in the coming period, we will be conducting a lot of consultations with, um, with the countries around the Indo-Pacific re region to try and develop that, uh, that notion, to develop that security uh, partnerships um, uh, with them in all areas, maritime security, but also cyber uh, fighting international and border crossing crime piracy and so on, and as well as uh, uh, countering um, uh, terrorism. Um, the last dimension I should mention um, is the dimension of uh, democracy and human rights and values, if you like. Now, democracy and human rights uh, aren't implemented in the same way across uh, the world, um, certainly also not um, uh, within the Indo-Pacific region. Um, we have nevertheless a, a drive to engage countries and regions uh, on this topic. And the relevance of that, I think, is very well illustrated by uh, the events in Myanmar, uh, where um, a, a coup d'etat uh, by the military, of course, has set back uh, uh, all the gains that uh, Myanmar had made uh, ever since uh, it's uh, the restoration of, uh, of democracy there. And that is bad for the country itself, but it's also bad for ASEAN, uh, for the ASEAN partnership, which of, of course is harmed and hindered uh, uh, in, uh, as a result of this, uh, this major, major political upheaval. Um, so, as EU, uh, we will wish to strengthen uh, those countries and those entities um, working for uh, stable democratic order, for the respect of, uh, uh, for human rights. And, um, and here uh, I can say uh, that again, ASEAN stands out as a very important partner for us. Not as the only partner, but certainly as a very important partner, a like-minded one in many respects, not a perfect partnership, and uh, uh, I won't elaborate, but um, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, so we count a lot on our cooperation with ASEAN um, on this topic. We will support ASEAN 
on its uh, the strengthening and consolidation of the democratic space uh, in in the region and um, uh, for the case of uh, uh, for the sake of the uh, the case of uh, Myanmar, but also looking beyond uh, that. Um, now, how will it all work? Uh, our in in the Pacific. Uh, uh partnership um first of all uh, as i mentioned we're still in a little bit of a drafting phase a finalization of a detailed strategy <clears throat> you can expect it um, to come out um, um, in september um secondly during the drafting and um as well as after the publication and we'll be, we will be reaching out uh, to all countries that uh, take an interest uh, in it, that wish to partner with us. And here is something that I uh, should stress very, very clearly, that our strategy is not uh, directed against anybody in, inside the region, not at all. It's an inclusive one. And uh, we... Um, wish to partner uh, with everybody um, in those areas where a partnership is, is possible and um, reciprocated. And that, of course, very particularly also includes China, um, a very important partner for us, as it is for, uh, for Indonesia. Um, a complex partnership, a complicated partnership uh, even, um, for us, uh, right now, um, we have a number of major differences with China in the area of human rights um, in particular, and also we have concerns about um, the um, uh, military um, um, build-up and, and paramilitary build-up um, by China in the South China Sea. Um, but to solve that, um, uh, we... Uh, are keen to have dialogue uh, to discuss and uh, to iron out um, uh, misunderstandings and to convince uh, Chinese uh, partners um, of the uh, uh, primordial importance of safeguarding um, the multilateral order of respecting international law of fulfilling um, um, commitments made in, in the international framework, uh, multilateral uh, framework. So that is our approach, an inclusive one uh, of par partnership in the all areas where we can and not um, um, uh, drive to um, exclude um, countries. Um, I conclude by um, a word on the results of the of the visits visits by the the EU's high representative uh, for foreign and security policy he's also the vice president of the European Commission uh, to Indonesia uh, at the start of this month I think uh, I can summarize the visit by saying that it it was very much in the spirit of uh, presenting uh, to his interlocutors um, the new EU um, Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, explain where we're coming from, uh, uh, describe uh, what motivates us, um, uh, propose um, the cooperation uh, with ASEAN, but also with Indonesia being uh, by far the largest um, 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 politically heaviest <coughs> um, country within ASEAN. So it was a an very um, open exploratory, uh, exploratory uh, visit and so were the discussions. Um, to note that this was the, the first visit um, by the EU's um, uh, foreign policy, our representative uh, since 2016. Uh, that's too long ago, uh, and the high representative uh, 
uh, High Representative Borrell when he was here, he uh, frankly admitted it. <laughs> so he, um, um, but um, the meetings he had with the Indonesian leaders and uh, with uh, those of ASEAN uh, were excellent, um, very open and very uh, frank and, um, and, and positive. Um, the main message um, from um, the side of the High Representative uh, was that uh, we can do better um, as, as partners, Indonesia and, uh, and EU. Uh, we have suffered um, over the past two years, probably, maybe three, uh, we've suffered um, somewhat uh, uh, as a result of the dispute over palm oil and uh, biofuels. Uh, now, th that dispute uh, won't go away easily, but uh, we can handle it objectively and in a rule-based way uh, through the WTO uh, dispute settlement procedure a procedure that is happening uh, uh, right now. So, and certainly um, the, the high representatives expressed the wish not to let that dispute eclipse everything else. And I do think that they should speak for themselves, of course, but the Indonesian leaders um, agreed with that uh, <coughs> observation, agreed that there are too many important matters um, that we need to work on together. Um, <clears throat> too many to be sidetracked into disputes over one particular issue, however important that issue is for Indonesia. So we have, uh, are following the visit, I think a very good agenda of work ahead of us. So a lot of things to be done for my my staff here at the EU delegation, as well as um, for the uh, uh, the EU colleagues uh, sitting in in Brussels, uh, in all areas, uh, the trade and economy um, dimension, extremely important, uh, um, underdeveloped uh, as yet, um, not at all at the level where it could be and should be. Um, so we have a job to do and boosting the economic and trade relations. Of course, negotiating the, uh, the SEPA free trade agreement is one um, uh, important task that both of us, both Indonesia and us, want to complete as quickly as, as we can next year and a half or so. Um, but more importantly is, is to look at everything that surrounds the, um, the, the duties and tariffs on, uh, on trades and on, uh, of, of goods and trade and services. It's about building a true economic partnership. Partnership that is um, very much led by rulemaking, by rules uh, that may not be identical uh, for both of us, but that resemble each other sufficiently uh, to make to create a level economic space uh, where Indonesian firms, our firms uh, can do their thing. And um, business can do business a lot better than, than diplomats and, and, and government officials. But business needs to have a, a strong and positive and um, <coughs> uh, stimulating regulatory framework and we are negotiating the setup of such a framework within the SEPA uh, free trade um, agreement. Um, the second big priority for us will be the green agenda. Um, important to highlight what the high representative told his interlocutors the president, foreign minister, parliament uh, in particular. And he highlighted that, of course, um, the developing countries, so the emerging countries like Indonesia, um, have a right to develop, 
uh, that uh, they need the right to develop, uh, to climb the income ladder and, uh, and uh, uh, realize their destinies. Um, at the same time, the high representative put forward uh, the notion that such development, uh, economic development, needs to go hand in hand with sustainability notions, with the green principles, with um, sparing the natural resources, um, with uh, cutting uh, CO2. Um, that is not an option any longer. The, um, the climate crisis is there. Uh, we can't ignore it. Uh, Indonesia can't. We can't. Uh, nobody can. Um, so we have to somehow to find the way uh, to grow the economy at the same time as uh, reducing the impact of economic growth on our natural environment, on the climate, on the forest, on the seas. So that is a, a very, very big agenda. Um, on which we need to work together. The EU has a lot of know-how. Uh, we, we've done that not perfectly, but fairly successfully on the European continent for the past four decades. Um, now, in, in all areas, in the next three decades, we want to create a circular economy, a carbon neutral economy by the year 2050. And um, in other words, um, there is a wonderful opportunity for the EU and for Indonesia and looking beyond that also other ASEAN countries to partner, uh, to go down this road of greening economy, of sustainable growth uh, together with, of course, in 2030, the, the milestone of the SDGs coming up. We have that milestone, uh, Indonesia has the same, uh, so there's every reason to think that we can uh, strike a very close cooperation on that uh, topic. Hard work, of course, and not easy, um, but um, if there's political will, it can be done. And the last block, big block of work, um, um, as a follow-up to the visit, I think, has to do with uh, security, um, with this new dimension that um, the EU is bringing to its relations uh, with third countries. Uh, we do that in our near abroad, in, uh, near, in and surrounding near Europe, but also elsewhere. You may not know, but... Um, uh, the EU is running uh, <clears throat> 19, one well, nine uh, peace missions in uh, around the world, uh, all based on a mandate from the UN or similar. And um, so that that is pretty big. And the um, so on such a job, uh, it's good to have partners uh, to broaden the. Uh, uh, the approach to uh, lend greater credibility, multilateral credibility to approaches. And here, of course, uh, Indonesia is a, is a great partner uh, uh, to work with. You have a reputation as a peacekeeper, um, one of the countries that um, contributes um, most uh, uh, military uh, resources uh, for the for UN peacekeeping mission, especially uh, um, in the Middle East. Um, so there's a very strong experience and positive uh, basis um, in uh, Indonesian foreign and defense policy. Um, so our thinking, hence our thinking, uh, that we can do more also bilaterally. Uh, by participation of Indonesia and in mission EU peace missions um, that are of interest and of you know, security interest uh, to uh, Indonesia. 
in other areas, I want to elaborate that are the security topics, definitely maritime security, um, fighting cybercrime, uh, other um, border crossing crime and organized crime, plus, of course, the whole dimension of, uh, of, um, of counter uh, terrorism. Um, Last point, very concrete um, uh, topic is all the, has to do with the, the maritime routes. Uh, I mentioned the Malacca Straits, um, and there are others. Um, we have, from the side of the EU, we've, we've run for some time uh, a, um, an action on uh, protecting and safeguarding uh, critical maritime routes in uh, South Asia. Um, that's an activity we wish to expand uh, to Southeast Asia and, uh, uh, and beyond. And, and here, of course, we are seeking partnership from uh, the countries of ASEAN and very particularly um, Indonesia. Look at your geographic location, look at your, the, the shape of your country. Um, this is something that that benefits um, Indonesia tremendously. I don't need to explain that uh, to anybody. And, um, and it's something where Indonesia has something important uh, to offer uh, to itself, to, the, to the, the region and to the partnership with, with the EU and um, in the, for the sake of uh, promoting uh, a well-run maritime space um, for the benefit of, uh, of trade, investment and cooperation. Um, the very last point that was uh, came up repeatedly was uh, I wish to uh, partner with Indonesia on multilateral matters at the UN, of course, <coughs> but also um, uh, in connection with uh, the upcoming presidency of, uh, of Indonesia of the G20 um, group uh, starting January next year. And on that topic, uh, some meetings will be taking place <coughs> already next week um, um, at uh, the foreign ministers meeting of the G20 um, <coughs> under the Italian presidency meeting taking place in, uh, in Italy. I stop there with my introduction about 40 minutes a bit a bit long but i'm sorry for that but um i'm i hand back the floor to to ray for whatever is next okay thank you so much ambassador and no don't worry we have time for you to <laughs> explain and um again thank you so much ambassador for the long list uh, of detailed uh updates and information in all areas, such as the vaccines, uh, you mentioned the economic recovery for the EU, and then the security, the Indo-Pacific, the EU-ASEAN relations, and among other things. Uh, very much appreciated. And also, I uh, would like to say that I hope that the High Representative Borel had a great time uh, visiting Jakarta earlier this month, and we hope that more representatives uh, from the EU can visit, you know, uh, Indonesia more often for uh, subsequent collaborations and partnerships in the future. So now uh, let's go ahead and dive into our questions and answer sessions. I'll be taking several questions per batch and which will be then answered by the ambassador before moving on to the next batch. So uh, I encourage all the participants here, uh, whether in the Zoom meeting or in the YouTube channel, in our YouTube channel, to ask questions. So um, to ask your questions uh, for our FPCA chapters in the Zoom meeting, you can use the raise hand feature by clicking the participants and then selecting raise hands on the bottom right. You may also use the chat box uh, to submit your questions. Please state your name and also your questions, but do limit it to one question uh, per person. So is there anybody who wants to ask directly to an ambassador? Please raise, uh, use the raise hand feature. 
and don't be shy. Um, I can take some of the questions uh, from the chat box first, uh, Ambassador, if that's okay. Yes. So we have um, Andis from FPCI Chapters Jayabaya from Jakarta. Uh, would you agree if ASEAN modeled their economic system based on the EU monetary system? From your perspective, experience, and knowledge, is it possible sometimes in the future that ASEAN as a whole has their own United Defensive and Security System uh, by means standardized equipment and also assets and research sharing against a possible enemy, for example, uh, in this case might be like China and yeah, other countries. And the second questions, yes, uh, the second questions we have from uh, Unita Fajarani, also from uh, Jayabaya. How European Union handle radicalism issues? Does the European Union have any policies about the ra radicalism? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um... Um, <clears throat> the first question from the, the colleague um, in Jakarta, I didn't catch his, his or her name, about the monetary system for um, a monetary system for ASEAN that resembles the EU's <clears throat> and, uh, and also a common defense uh, system. <laughs> you know, this, uh, these are very fundamental questions, of course. And um, <clears throat> let's let's put it this way: for the monetary system, it um, this has been uh, for the EU a project that has lasted, whose preparation has has lasted um, a good forty years, essentially. Um, and and why is that so? Uh, because it's um, having a, a single currency, uh, which is essentially what you're talking about then, it, it requires a, a, a large degree of coherence and convergence between the economies of, uh, of the participants in that single currency. It uh, presupposes a, um, a capacity to compete, uh, you know, um, on a level playing field between those partners. In other words, your companies have to have the strength uh, to uh, compete with everybody else. If, if not, it would go wrong. Um, the economic fund, the man, macroeconomic fundamentals have to be uh, the same um, for everybody. Um, so it's there's a lot, a lot of preparatory work needed there. And and let's also face it, has the uh, EU experience been easy uh, in this regard? No, it has not. Uh, not because uh, during the, the fair weather times, uh, when everything goes well and the whole world is growing and so on, no. Um, it, we had a major, major challenge and a major risk even uh, during the financial crisis of 2009, when one or two or maybe three uh, member states were in severe, severe trouble financially. And um, there was a risk that one or the other uh, could drop out of the, uh, the single currency. Now, something like that is, of course, a disaster. It would be a disaster for political reasons, for economic reasons, for uh, financial reasons. So you have to be on extremely solid ground uh, together. Uh, to uh, to make such a notion work. And right now, within ASEAN, um, I don't think the conditions are, are, are there yet. Um, it may come, but it will take a lot of time um, to build it up. And there are big differences between the, member, the uh, economies of the ASEAN member states. So, and... We, you have to get closer together economically, financially, macroeconomically, uh, institutionally and, uh, for a single currency to work. So I have um, my answer to the question in short is uh, uh, not soon. 
the second question about the, uh, the defense mechanism. Um, First of all, there has to be a political basis. You have to have a common understanding of what your foreign policy, what your defense policy is, your priorities, your interests, what the risks are. So that's a lot of intellectual um, uh, work needed, um, lots of reflection, analyses um, of the outside, the external side, but also internally. Um, how do the militaries work um, in one member state compared to the other? Is there a common basis? Uh, if not, it can be expanded. Um, all of these very fundamental um, uh, preparation uh, tasks are needed. Um, but um, in a sense, um, it is possible to start with part of the idea uh, and build up gradually. You can decide as a, as a group of countries, whoever it is, uh, let's start with joint peace missions um, in trouble countries within the grouping itself or outside. Um, as, as soon as there is a uh, some sort of political basis, the UN Security Council or what have you, um, you can jointly uh, send a mission uh, with, you know, military people coming from different countries, uh, equipment and, and so on. That's doable. Um, also at sea, you can easily imagine that and something is already happening there uh, about um, developing a, a common notion about how to monitor um, maritime security in the, in the South China Sea. Um, so, um, in, in a sense, you have more flexibilities um, in the defense area to build up items bit by bit and uh, from the smaller um, activities gradually move on to something larger. And, uh, and in, a, in a sense, that is also how the EU has, has done this itself. <coughs> So uh, that's for question one. Um, the second question on radicalization. Very profound matter, of course, um, in, in Indonesia and in Europe as well. Um, the, the topic of radicalization has <coughs> particularly been uh, come, to, uh, come to the fore as a result of the uh, the cyber environment in which we live and, and work and play, and etc., cetera, um, uh, which has, of course, created beautiful things for most of us and, and totally positive. But uh, it's also true that the, the social media particularly have been abused tremendously by persons or entities that uh, promote radicalization, violent extremism and what have you. And we see the results of that. In, we've seen that in Europe with terrorist attacks, and uh, Indonesia has, has had uh, its problems uh, as well. So, uh, fighting radicalization, of course, um, requires dealing with uh, the root causes of the radical ideologies. There is no two ways about it. Um, um, there is no place for radicalization, violent radicalization, uh, certainly in a democratic society, in a rule-based society, in a society that respects and tolerates uh, differences um, between human beings or between groups. Uh, so this is a very, uh, there's a need for a very active, proactive policy by the government, by parliaments uh, for that, by the civil society by academics um, uh, to um, deal with root causes. And secondly, sometimes yeah, there is a need to uh, um, enforce um, um, uh, counter-terrorism, counter-radicalization and, and apply the rule of law, and take, uh, take uh, the uh, law enforcement bodies have to take action. Um, Cyber is, is a new problem 
the challenge for everybody. Um, just two days ago, when was it? Two days ago, I think. Tuesday, yeah. Um, we did a, uh, no, yesterday, last yesterday. Uh, we did a, a, a meeting with, um, with UNESCO um, in, uh, in Indonesia uh, about the use of uh, social media for hate speech or abuse of social media for hate speech and what can you do about it. Uh, so that is one way where we have to discuss more. And here is a very difficult balance to be struck. Uh, on the one hand, of course, you have to have the powers uh, to intervene if hate speech happens. Um, at the same time, you uh, want to uh, uh, preserve the right, the freedom of expression, um, and uh, as well. So um, that's a delicate balance, and somewhere uh, or rather, society, the judiciary. Has to uh, has to strike that balance. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your questions. Uh, sorry, for your answers, of course. And now we'll be taking um, two questions from our YouTube channel. Uh, we have Ben Hariman. Uh, he's a professional worker at bank, and his question is: What is EU's new strategy? in strengthening the cooperations of Indo-Pacific to deal with the effects of these pandemic situations from every sector. So yeah, the cooperations of Indo-Pacific to deal with the effects of the pandemic. And for the second questions, we have Jenny Sari Winata from our FPCA chapter, uh, Universitas Pita Harapan. Jenny's question is, what has changed and what has not worked in the EU's new strategy for corporations within the Pacific, specifically with Indonesia? Yes. So what has changed and what has not working uh, in the EU's new strategy for corporations within the Pacific, specifically with Indonesia? Thank you. Um, all right. Um, first, a question from uh, from Ben Hari uh, about uh, in the Pacific and uh, the pandemic. I think that um, the pandemic is something that happens now that needs a response now, uh, uh, and that uh, is. A response that is irrespective of the uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy or what have you. Um, this is a global affair um, that requires global responses, multilateral, the UN um, in particular for um, the policy formulation for the vaccine uh, distribution uh, through the COVAX mechanism and um, WHO uh, for the um, um, the analytical, statistical, and the medicine uh, vaccine approval um, dimension. So I would not um, say uh, that the um, the response to the pandemic uh, has a direct one-on-one -on -one link with the, the Indo-Pacific now. Uh, what you can, uh, strategy now, what you can say is that um, the Inner Pacific strategy is one about uh, strengthening resilience, uh, strengthening uh, the governance um, of um, uh, by countries of their public health uh, systems. It's about uh, striking links or making links, um, promoting cooperation between countries in the in the Pacific and and Europe uh, on this. So. More in the long in the longer term, uh, you can easily imagine that that this will be one of the lessons learned from the COVID crisis. A lesson learned uh, that the EU and um, the Indo-Pacific region, or specific countries or entities, ASEAN, for instance, in that region, will work together on a long-lasting uh, basis uh, for specific activities. For instance, on um, the question of vaccine production, 
um, this is vaccines or and other pharmaceuticals will be a critical need for the future uh, on a uh, re recurrent basis. Uh, we can't expect that the COVAX facility will be there up and running uh, for good. Uh, we have to create capacity in countries um, around the world uh, to produce what they need um, under license from other companies, uh, possibly uh, or not. Uh, so that is, I think, an area of work where, uh, where the Indo-Pacific could, uh, could make a difference. Um, just a, a note, um, the EU is rolling out a, a vaccine production strategy for Africa, <clears throat> which is the region that is most lacking in vaccine production capacity. Um, so that has was decided uh, uh, a month ago that we do we do that in Africa and um, as a first priority but I, I do see the possibility of doing something comparable uh, with uh, the Indo-Pacific countries as well. On uh, Jeannie's question uh, what's new what what has changed in the relations between EU and Indonesia as a result of the strategy for the in the Pacific and what isn't working. Um, well, Jeannie, uh, the, 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 the strategy was adopted only two months ago. So um, give us a little bit of time <laughs> to, um, to, um, to get going on it. And uh, um, so I think we are now still in the phase of, uh, of soundings with, uh, with uh, partners in, in the Pacific and uh, about presenting our ideas, explaining uh, the notions, some are new notions, uh, and also finding out what countries like, what, what they want from us, uh, where, uh, to see where the partnership areas are uh, for, you know, in the, in the in short run and for, and for the, medium, the medium term. So that is the phase we are in uh, with Indonesia, uh, also with the other countries in ASEAN and, and beyond. And um, uh, so, uh, and that will take a little bit of time. Um, the good thing, and I, I, I really want to stress that, the good thing is uh, what it shows this strategy is that um, EU, the EU member states uh, and societies have woken up to the reality uh, of the Indo-Pacific region in a major way. And, um, uh, of course, academics knew and some policymakers knew uh, what was going on in the Indo Pacific. But I think uh, the strategy that we have shows a, a grown realization of, um, of the need for the EU to partner with the Indo Pacific uh, for the long run on strategic topics and on shared cooperation, people to people topics, in order to. Uh, uh, to have solid, lasting, and, and, and healthy partnership with, with this uh, vast, fast-growing uh, uh, region. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ambassador, for your answers. And we actually have uh, more questions lined up on our YouTube channel. Um, next, we have a question from Ilham Maulana from Bandung. He's an outdoor writer. How is the business development growth between the EU to Indo-Pacific in Indonesia in this pandemic or afterwards or after the pandemic? So uh, yes, again, how is about the business development growth between the EU to Indo-Pacific in Indonesia during this pandemic or even the post-pandemic? And for the next questions, we have Willie, Willie uh, from Center for Business and Diplomatic St Studies from Venus Universities. How can the EU make sure that an increase in military presence in the region is not posed as threat for the neighborhood? Again, how can the EU make sure that an increase in military presence in the region is not posed as threat for the neighborhood? Thank you. Thanks. Well, 
on the first question from um, uh, Ihan Mohammed, um, we took a dip in our uh, trade in, um, last year. Um, I forget the figure now, but it, I think it was minus 20% or so in, in a trade volume between Indonesia and and uh, and uh, the EU. Um, a similar declines also with other uh, countries in in the Indo Pacific. Uh, so trade wise was 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 very poor, and but you know the reason why. Um, um, the on investment, uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, the figures um, quickly recovered, and um, in Indonesia we've had quite some. Um, some decent projects uh, come on, on, on stream uh, with uh, with you know decent decent money involved uh, investments into this country in, in various sectors. So um, so that has held up um, reasonably. Uh, but what 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 next? I, I think that um, we can we could provide it. We have kept the pandemic reasonably under control. Uh, here in Indonesia, Southeast Asia, and in Europe, uh, we can look forward to a, a fairly rapid rebound in both the growth figures in general, but also in the, in the bilateral trade. Um, the the um, forecast for Indonesia for this year is, is it looks looks good, maybe a bit under pressure now, but but um, but if it all works out, then this this is going to go. Pretty quickly, there's a, a lot of resilience um, in in your economy and a, a drive towards growth. The people, <laughs> I'm sure, uh, uh, much will depend on the consumer demand, and um, uh, all of us have been saving money. Uh, I think not not spending money in the past uh, year so much. Uh, so there's a lot of. Uh, Purchasing power in the in the bank accounts of some people, and they're, they're waiting for the right moment. So, um, consumer demand will drive the growth uh, this year and the next. Uh, besides uh, investment, so um, let's see. Uh, the key question remains: Will we get the pandemic under control in a sustainable way? And will we be able to avoid the shocks um, that we had um, last last year? Um, very good question from uh, Willie, if I got the name, name right. Um, is there what about the risk of uh, that uh, the increased military presence uh, uh, causes uh, inquietude or, or, or worries? Um, Amongst the countries, uh, countries here, or some people in them, you know, it all depends on uh, what the military increased military presence is for. Uh, the motivation, the, the objectives, the stated intention, the transparency, uh, the cooperation uh, with other countries, uh, you know, that's makes a difference um, without all of that of course you have you will provoke worries uh, but with cooperation with transparency with communication with uh, links and partnerships uh, it does exactly the opposite it builds trust it, it, it strengthens, strengthens understanding and familiarity uh, why do um, countries navies military uh, why do they do military exercises with one another? Um, to learn, of course, uh, to techniques, cooperation, but more fundamentally, it's about building trust and um, and resilience for uh, for for possible uh, shocks um, in in the future. So I think that is um, that is key to understand. Um, the EU wants to have greater defense cooperation with countries in the, in the, in the Pacific and particularly with Southeast, Southeast Asia. Uh, we feel we have something to offer. This is not uh, the 
an offer of military hardware that is aimed to dominate. No, it is uh, an offer of, uh, of cooperation uh, in all ways, soft ways and in the harder ways uh, with hardware involved and with military involved uh, to strengthen stability. And so um, provided we do that well and carefully and communicate well and discuss well, it will be a positive uh, factor for stability in the region rather than a source of uh, concern is my conviction. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. And for our final batch, uh, I'll be taking... <clears throat> Sorry, yes. So for our final batch, I'll be taking three questions. Um, next, we have Ilham Malana. Oh, sorry, that's uh, we have that. We have Tiara Kinanti from Universitas Andalas from Padang. Uh, what does the EU Indo Pacific strategy mean for the IUU fishing in ASEAN? Should we expect more yellow and red cards or less from the EU? <laughs> yes, that's for the first questions. And the second one we have again from Willie. Uh, how does the EU Indo Pacific strategy align with the ASEAN MPAC or China's maritime silk and road? And for our last questions, we have here in the chat box uh, from Rizky from our FPCA chapter, Venus University. Thank you for the invaluable information, uh, Mr. Ambassador. These questions might diverge from our discussions today, but I would like to ask the following questions. What are the EU's current actions in the Pacific Islands and or the African region? Thank you. And yes, and I'll give back the floor to Ambassador. <coughs> All right. Um, now yeah, on the, the first question about the IUU, the um, illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing, uh, um, <clears throat> this is something that uh, we pursue already now. Um, it is, you know, led by UN policies, uh, we which we have on the EU side put uh, into our own legislation, and we will pursue that. Um, the EU is not in the, itself in the business of um, handing out red or yellow cards. Uh, that is more something for the referees in the European football championship taking place in, in Europe these weeks. Um, but um, the way we approach that is very much through cooperation um, <clears throat> with um, the, uh, the key countries that supply fish uh, to us. Um, cooperation by um, helping uh, countries set up a strong enforcement mechanism, reporting mechanism, and, and so forth. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, by um, agreeing uh, not uh, to to import fish uh, that is not um, um, uh, does not meet the IUU standards, and I think that is for us, for, whether it's fish or other products, uh, one of the major tools we have uh, by simply refusing to buy illegal stuff, and um, and in other words. Uh, stop demand uh, for fish uh, that is not proven um, uh, legal um, and uh, uh, sustainably fished under the IUU norms. Um, here, I think also our, uh, our future SEPA agreement will pay attention um, to this. We have, will have a chapter on sustainable trade, sustain, sustainable trade and sustainable development, it's called. Uh, so in that connection, we, we will also be able to work with Indonesia to strengthen your capacity to uh, 
um, enforce IUU um, standards, uh, such um, uh, support is, is needed. <coughs> um, on the, um, the Silk and Road and, and similar initiatives, uh, here and in, uh, from the side of the EU, uh, we have our uh, connectivity strategy for Asia. And um, I think all of these initiatives um, uh, have common features. Um, they all have a desire to connect and boost trade and links and so on. So that's a very positive sort of drive. Um, the problem is sometimes the, the power politics that is behind. Uh, some of these actions. Uh, we see that, for instance, um, with the Belt and Road um, initiatives um, in um, some of our member states in, back in Europe, um, where uh, the Belt and Road projects um, are uh, a sort of uh, counter thesis against uh, the, um, the integration within the EU and all the funding that goes on. Um, another worry about uh, some of the initiatives, certainly once on the Belt and Road, um, is the debt that it causes um, amongst the uh, recipient countries. And we see some of that also happen in some European countries, including non-EU countries in, in, in Europe. Uh, and that is, of course, a negative effect. And, um, our approach is not like that, um, and our approach is also uh, based on transparency, on procurement, um, transparency as regards environmental standards, and, um, and it's based on principle of um, developing the country rather than making um, the recipient country um, dependent. Um, and it's very much seen uh, from our point of view, our connectivity drive towards um, in the Pacific is seen as a way to help develop uh, the economy, uh, economies of, uh, of our partner countries uh, for the longer, longer run. <clears throat> uh, then the last question, um, policy, EU policies for the Pacific Islands and for Africa. Uh, from risky, uh, risky, <laughs> you're asking a very large question. And, um, but let me put it for Africa that that's the story in itself and, and requires two, two or three um, FPCI lectures uh, uh, by somebody else, maybe than myself. But, um, uh, but just to say that the bottom line for our approach to Africa is one of development. And uh, uh, in all countries individually, and, and uh, development of the Africa, African continent as a whole, we are st very strong partners of the African Union. Um, we support that entity. We support uh, the drive towards um, creating a, um, a common trade space in in Africa, um, and. So it's a, a, a very close partnership. Is it enough? Not yet. We need to go further. More investment is needed, but also private sector investment. Um, and of course, we have to work on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the health and medical and COVID uh, dimensions. I referred to that earlier on. Uh, the Pacific Islands re region, um, a key thing for us is to help those countries um, face uh, the climate risks that they have, uh, very, very major ones. Um, uh, so we are uh, a partner for, with them on that score. We finance quite a number of projects uh, to help the Pacific Island countries um, make the energy turnaround um towards renewables um, which a transition that will also lead uh, make them less dependent on imports which is good for their economy and which is also good for their 
resilience. So that, that is a key feature of our cooperation, um, the green dimension and development um, in, in general. Trade-wise, of course, these countries are very small, so there's not a very strong relationship there. So it's more political and development. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much again, ambassadors. And unfortunately, due to the time constraints, we have to end it here. Um, so again, uh, thank you, Ambassador Piquet, for all your detailed answers. And thank you for all the students and also the participants uh, who are tuning in in our YouTube channel for your questions. That was a very insightful discussion. And I believe that all of us here have learned a lot, especially in regards to the EU uh, ASEAN relations and also uh, the Indo-Pacific as well. Um, before we close, I would like to encourage all the participants uh, in the Zoom meeting to turn on your camera as we will have a virtual group photo shoots for the ambassador lecture. So please, um, everyone, turn on your camera. We're going to have a virtual photo shoots together. Don't be shy. So we're gonna wait for everyone to turn in the camera. Jaya Baya. Yes. And I'm going to ask my colleague Kwahyu for the countdown. Is there anybody else who wants to turn on their camera? Please do so because we're going to take the photo shoot, the virtual photo shoot soon. Yes. Um, Lukman, um, your camera is a bit dark. I'm not sure if you're aware, but okay. Um, so we're going to take uh, the virtual photo shoots in one, two, three. Again, one more. One, two, three. And maybe different freestyles, different styles. Okay. One, two, and three. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. And with that, we have. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you, Ambassador. And with that, we have come to the end of our EU Ambassador Lecture today. Thank you so much, Ambassador Piquet, and on behalf of FPCI. And the audience here today, I would like to extend our gratitude to the uh, delegations of the European Union uh, in Jakarta, and also to all the students and all the participants who have joined us today. Thank you to everyone uh, for your de uh, delightful and thought-provoking questions and ambassadors for your answers. We hope to see you again in our uh, future events, and I hope you all stay safe. See you. Thank you very much indeed to everybody for the participation and stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy and hope to see you again soon. You too, Ambassador. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone.